Well, I'd like to thank the uh, organizers of this for the invitation to participate. This is my first CIDR, and uh, I, I'm really looking forward to it, both uh, interacting with the students and particularly learning about uh, the other aspects of this, uh, this subject that uh, I don't know so well. Dave and I decided to uh, split the uh, introductory talk today. Uh, what I'd like to do with my part of it is to sort of breeze through what the geochemists are going to cover in the, the six uh, lectures that we're going to be giving. So you'll, you'll miss a lot of detail here. It will be filled in uh, in the individual lectures. Uh, this deep time is a big phenomenon, as Mark, Mark said. It'll cover uh, basically everything that take uh, the planet from a bunch of dust in the, in the solar nebula to something that looks like this and these individual layers. So what I'd like to concentrate on really is, is sort of the time scale and the processes by which these layers of the Earth, so the outer atmosphere, Sujoy will be dealing with that in detail in his talk. This uh, may or may not be homogeneous mantle and then the inner core uh, or the core separation as well. Uh, my story is going to start way back in time, uh, back when the Earth looked something like this. Uh, a molecular cloud, just a bunch of dispersed dust and gas, or probably a few tens of degrees Kelvin sitting around in the solar, in the, in the galaxy somewhere. Uh, we'll move on one quick step. I'll, I'll skip the step from here. Some uh, process causes the initial collapse of that, uh, uh, or at least an area of a molecular cloud, uh, to the point where you get a central uh, mass concentration that has enough gravity to continue the process. So this is where I'm going to start. When you've got this uh, basically protostar in the middle of it, warming up the interior of the uh, gas that's it's, uh, come down, it's rotating and uh, has formed a disk and is moving on the way into the sun. Eventually it'll segregate out itself in, into a planetary system. The key to the, uh, the start uh, of the story here is that the temperatures in this area are very hot. So we went from tens of degrees Kelvin to thousands of degrees Kelvin. Uh, basically, the assumption is that we vaporize everything in the inner solar system. I'll show you in the detailed talk that that's not, in fact, true, uh, but it's a good starting point to talk about processes that can change the composition of planets. One of those, of course, is condensation. So if you start with a solar nebula that's uh, basically all gas, and it's being stirred by the, the motions of the, of the uh, nebula. Uh, as it cools down, uh, you'll start condensing elements. Most of these elements out here, this is a plot of condensation temperature. 50% of these uh, elements will be condensed by these temperatures. And you see there's a bunch of these, these sort of trace elements that condense out at 18, 1600 degrees uh, this is Kelvin, I think, uh, which aren't a lot of a consequence because they're just not enough abundance to really, really do much. But the, by the time you start getting down a bit, you're getting into elements like aluminum and calcium, which are major elements in, in uh, the Earth and, and uh, in particular. So you're starting to form real, real rocky uh, uh, dust at this stage. And then you get in this uh, interval between about 14 and, and uh, 1,200 degrees where you're condensing the main mass of, of the uh, solar nebula gust. And by condensation of these elements, you have, they're condensed with smaller elements? They're, uh, what's happening here, they're probably condensing as very small dust grains simply because there's not enough of them to do much. By the time you're getting to here with magnesium and silicon, they're condensing as, uh, in this case, probably uh, olivine, so magnesium silicon oxide. Uh, on the other hand, in gases of this composition with solar. But I think what Michael's asking is, should we look at this and say, okay, these elements are condensing as pure elements? Uh, some of these might well be. Some of these out here where you're doing osmium and the like may be condensing into alloys of, of those elements, osmium, platinum, iridium. Uh, you know, these are so unabundant that we're not really interested in that. By the time you get to elements like aluminum and calcium, they're condensing as all sorts of things. Aluminum oxide, uh, hibonite, which is a calcium titanium oxide, uh, plagioclase, calcium aluminum silicate oxide. So, so they're condensing into basically mineral grains of all sorts of, of minerals. Uh, the main mineral that's of importance, and of course all of you know about the mantle, know about olivine. Olivine is one of the main things that's going to condense in this, this region where the magnesium and the silicon start coming out of, of the gas phase. Iron in this composition, though, is probably going to condense mostly as, as metal uh, in the gas of solar composition, so as, as real al iron alloy. I'll just add that there's also nitrides and carbides. At, certainly out of, out of this range in particular, yeah. yeah. Well, in the detailed talks, we'll actually look at what's coming out of stars, which are even higher temperatures. So we'll, we'll get into a little bit. I'll show you some grains from that. But the point being is by, by this time, you're starting to condense enough mass where you're, you're getting a dusty nebula. You're getting the, the basic building blocks of the planets are forming here. Uh, so you've got magnesium, silicon, iron, which is most of, most of the Earth, basically, as oxides. 
Uh, and then you keep cooling in temperature and you start getting into what are called the moderately volatile elements. These include things like the alkalis, potassium, sodium, cesium, rubidium, things that you don't normally think of as being volatile but are given these kind of temperatures. Silver is one that we'll be dealing with in the uh, detailed discussions. Uh, so you condense those and then that keeps going. And eventually you get to the point where you, you uh, condense out water ice. Water, of course, or hydrogen is by far, factors of 10 to 6 or something, the most abundant uh, element in the, in the solar system. So by the time you start condensing something like water ice, you're talking about driving the mass of available uh, dust and ice up considerably. So this idea of, of a volatility control condensation leads to this idea of a, of a snow line, excuse the analogy here, but a snow line where if you're out beyond the point where water ices are condensing, you can form giant gaseous planets that have their full complement of, of hydrogen or at least a large proportion of it. Whereas if you're inside this, the temperature is simply too hot to allow that, that water to uh, condense as a, as a solid. It's left in the gas phase and probably blown away by an early active sun. So in the inner solar system then you get terrestrial planets that are just made out of things like olivine, so the rocky elements, uh, iron, iron metal in particular. Now we know from looking at extrasolar planets, is, you know, this seems to work uh, good. It's a simple model to tell students in the Earth. You've got this line basically between Mars and Jupiter here. Uh, you've got all the icy stuff out there and all the, the rocky stuff inside. But extrasolar planets, of course, the early discoveries of those were all these things called uh, uh, hot Jupiters. They're giant gaseous planets that are very close orbit to their sun and are probably very hot. What we know about uh, planets uh, from uh, just orbital dynamics is that they migrate uh, quite a bit in their orbits. This is an example. This is a work from my colleague John Chambers. What he did is start, uh, this is looking at gravitational accumulation of planets. So all he did here was throw in a few objects that there's like 10 or 15 of these that are a tenth the size of the mass. So think of something like this, and there's a bunch of little objects, it might, might be these guys, that are a hundredth of the mass of, of the Earth. And these are just placed into orbit around the, uh, around the sun at heliocentric distances. So there's one AU, the Earth, Earth sun distance, out to two AU. So these things are ro roaming around in the inner solar system, starting out initially in circular orbits, uh, shown here. And then what he did is just let them start orbiting and let gravitational perturbations. So they start getting close to one another. They start throwing themselves into eccentric orbits. They start migrating in and out of the, uh, of the uh, inner solar system. So let me start this and I'll stop it right away. Uh, so keep an eye on it. Things are going to jitter around. So the jittering is, uh, that you're seeing is basically these things are being perturbed into eccentric orbits. So something that might be here at a, a few uh, fraction of an AU gets thrown out to two AU in, in, in an eccentric orbit. And uh, with those orbits, then they start running into high probabilities of running into one another. And in this kind of simple calculation, when they run into one another, they just stick. And we'll see later that's probably not what happens, but it's a good start on it anyway. So what's happened here is these little guys here, two little guys have stuck together to form these. You know, three, four, five of the little ones have stuck together to form those. But what's really happened is that these big guys have uh, sucked up a, a main portion of the mass. So they sucked up a lot of little ones, and they've also sucked up some of their, their big starting components. So this is a rich get richer scenario. Uh, the big planets grow fast because they have the most mass, the most gravity, and they start sucking up all the, all the things around them. So I'm going to continue this uh, until it's, uh, what you'll see is a, a nice conclusion. But one of the things I want you to watch, both as, uh, as things get uh, Less dense in the solar nebula, uh, these planets start moving around all over the place. And the other thing is you'll see that a few of these very large objects run into one another late in the evolution of this, this calculation. So there's one that got sucked up. There you go. Okay, so that's the end. This is a nice calculation. This is one that John always likes to show because you end up with planets that look like Mercury. Uh, Venus, Earth, and Mars that are more or less the right mass, more or less the right distance from the sun. It would be nice to say all the calculations come out of this, but you can end up with three planets, you can end up with six planets, you can end up with all sorts of combinations of this. This is one that just happened to have something that looks like our solar system. But it, produ it shows some of the dynamics that I think are important in, in this uh, consideration of how uh, one might preserve chemical heterogeneity that was present in the nebula through this planetary accumulation process. So what John did here is simply tag these with a, a color code depending on where they started uh, in the solar system. So I've colored it red in the inner solar system, blue in the outer solar system. So you saw how much migration there was in these, inner, in these planets. Uh, as they're moving, they're, of course, mixing around the icy stuff from the outside and the volatile depleted stuff from the, the inner solar system. And there's a lot of mixing. So you can look at a planet like this. You see that basically uh, it starts in the green belt, or it ends up in the green belt, but it's got components from all of these uh, regions within the solar nebula. 
On the other hand, you look at some of these, and these only contain uh, components from the outer, uh, uh, outer parts of the terrestrial uh, planet forming region. So you, if there is chemical heterogeneity, as one might expect from a, like a heliocentric temperature gradient, then one can preserve it through this planet building process. So that's the first start point. We have an opportunity and a mechanism to provide uh, uh, differences in volatile contents between uh, the planets. So we look at volatile contents. This is a number of elements that are plotted according to their condensation temperature. Log of condensation temperatures here. The real condensation temperatures are up here. Uh, so what you're looking at is the, the refractory elements at this end uh, plot at abundances that are basically uh, the abundances in the sun. So there's been no fractionation of those in the Earth or in meteorites relative to the sun. They've all condensed. They've all formed in these rocky objects. But as you get to the, the uh, more and more volatile elements moving down this uh, region, you see uh, here you're, you're down by factors of, of something like 50 in concentration compared to the solar composition. So it looks like the Earth just didn't uh, uh, collect all of these volatile elements. They stayed in the gas phase, or they just didn't get transported in, into the inner solar system enough to make up an Earth like this. Uh, so what you also should notice on a diagram like this is it's not only restricted to the Earth, you can even look at some primitive uh, types of meteorites, carbonaceous chondrites, and you see similar sorts of volatile depletion even in them. So this segregation of volatile from refractory elements is a very important process probably occurring in the nebula. The option is, is that these were volatilized after planet formation, but uh, that's probably not the right answer. Uh, it looks like uh, the terrestrial planets simply didn't uh, collect their full inventories of these volatile elements when they were forming out of the nebula. We can actually put time constraints on that because one of the nice things about this phase of the solar system is uh, the solar system's chock full of short-lived radioactive nuclides because they were just injected from probably from the supernova that instigated the collapse. So one of these is the decay of manganese 53 uh, to chromium 53. This is a 3.5, 3.7 million year half-life. Uh, the inter interesting part of this is that manganese is a moderately volatile element. Chromium is more or less a refractory element. So what you see in uh, a plot of manganese-chromium ratio here in different types of meteorites uh, is a variation in manganese chromium ratio that's basically tracking the volatility of manganese. So something that's out at this end is basically solar in its manganese chromium ratio, and down here are things that are depleted in manganese because it, it's a volatile element and wasn't, wasn't collected. So if this volatile from refractory separation occurred after manganese 53 was dead, there would be no correlation here with this is the, this is the 53 chromium to 52 chromium ratio expressed in parts in 10,000. So you'll see a lot of these are just, these are really small variations, so there's no sense looking at the real six-digit ratios. Um, but what you see is there's a reasonable correlation here between the manganese chromium ratio and 53 chromium, suggesting that, that 53 manganese was alive when this volatile separation was occurring. More than that, you can look at where the Earth lies on this diagram. We, uh, by definition, it has uh, an epsilon 53 chromium of zero. That's just what we use as a standard that defines uh, this epsilon. Uh, and then we can bring it over to where it might intersect this isochron and look and see what, at its manganese chromium ratio. And this is within the estimates for uh, terrestrial manganese chromium ratios. So the inference from this then is that the Earth uh, obtained its volatile depletion within the slope of this isochron which if you look up here is 4566.4 million years. I wish we could know it that accurately. Precision and accuracy are very different things, obviously, in this game. Uh, but basically, we, the first solids in the solar nebula formed about 4568 million years. So we're looking at a volatile depletion that occurred no later than two to four million years after solar system uh, uh, collapse began, perhaps uh, much less than that. This overlaps with the age of solar system collapse. So this volatile depletion is something that happened right at the beginning of planet formation. Could that, could that be a It could be. Uh, we'll see that uh, the small bodies differentiated very quickly. The question here is whether you can volatilize this. Uh, there are other arguments I don't have time to go into right now that suggest that you did not volatilize these elements from a from a body of uh, solar composition, but you just didn't uh, accrete those elements. So I, I would think that it has more to do with the fact that these just didn't sample their full volatile inventory in the, in the nebula. They're right. Okay, so another obvious uh, separation that we can do in the solar nebula is iron and, and silicate. I mentioned that uh, out of a solar gas, iron condenses metal, whereas uh, silicates, particularly like olivine, magnesium silicon uh, oxide, uh, both, both are moderately vol or they're in the main group elements, so they uh, condense at moderately high temperatures. Uh, they have very different physical properties, though, of course. Iron metal has a much higher density than, than olivine. Uh, 
So uh, if there's gas drag involved and other uh, potential mechanisms to separate these, that's another thing that we could look for as a major uh, sort of pre-planet forming chemical differentiation. And we look here at this plot from, from Bill's work. He'll tell more about this in, in his talks uh, in the coming uh, few days here. This is a plot of iron versus magnesium, iron versus silicon. So it's basically iron versus the other two major elements in the Earth. And what you see is there's, uh, the meteorites display a huge range in these ratios from uh, the LL chondrites here. The LL, it's you know, a very astute definition of a chondrite. LL means it's really low in iron, right? And this is only slightly low in iron, and these are very high in iron. So, so that's the LL, 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 L, and H uh, chondrites. But what you see here is basically there's this big range in iron to silicate ratios, if you will, magnesium and silicon. Uh, so the meteorites did find a way to segregate iron from uh, magnesium and silicon and uh, other uh, silicate-loving uh, uh, elements. Uh, Bill plots the Earth out on this, out of this end of the diagram, suggesting that it has more iron than even most of the, the chondritic meteorites. CI would be the closest to the, the sun composition. Uh, and if you plot a mercury, it would plot out here because of the, the large core size. Yeah, Bill? I'd also like to highlight that Bill put that data dot there with no uncertainty. Yes, yeah, yeah you, you can cover that. Un uncertainties in this uh, in your talk. But the point being is that uh, what this shows is the meteorites found a way to segregate iron from the silicates, and it looks like the Earth was uh, sort of falling along that trend. The Earth doesn't end up with an iron to, to silicate ratio that's solar either. So. These, uh, so the LL, L, and H are ordinary chondrites. The E's are E, L for enstatite chondrite, low iron, enstatite chondrite, high iron. And then these are all t different types of uh, carbonaceous chondrites. So these are basically the, I mean, these are the primitive meteorites, if you will, and these, these are more evolved uh, classes of undifferentiated meteorites. I just will add that I'll actually add a bit more texture to this than I thought later. Yeah. Hmm. This doesn't distinguish between iron as present as metal and iron as present in silicates. Bill, you can answer that. I, I think not. This is just atomic iron, right? That's correct. And it's the bulk planetary composition for the Earth, and it's also the bulk rock composition for each one of the meteorites, which is an intimate mixture of metallic alloys and silicate material. And iron oxide, too. Oh, I just bought it up one day. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I stated my uncertainty about it because there are competing models for the amount of iron in the lower mantle. And so that, that's really the big question. Uh, but it's really, a, you can apply a small uncertainty for iron. But it's actually the magnesium and, and the silicon that will give you the much larger uncertainty because the amount of iron is really about 6% in the top of the mantle, 85% in the core. And some value you want to assign to the lower mantle, you can put some uncertainty on that. It's not going to change the iron content of the planet. But the amount of olivine versus the amount of pyroxene or the amount of uh, perovskite versus magnesium worstite is an enormous question as to the air bottom in that diagram. Yeah. Yeah, these are the kind of details that will be. summarize that in one sentence? Uh, no. Uh, these are the details that we'll be covering in the, in the talks during the week. Uh, yeah. Rick, <laughs> Oh, yeah. Uh, well, the point being is that uh, there are various ways to accommodate this where iron is a fairly well-known, but uh, the issues of magnesium and silicon depend uh, on issues like how much silicon is in the core, for example. It could, uh, could change these numbers by a significant amount. So there, there are issues pretty much with all of these numbers, probably less with, with magnesium than any of them, but, uh, but it's an issue, and there's lots of arguments about various uh, sides of the, the, the story. Uh, so in the volatility, I tried to convince you there was something that was happening in the nebula that the Earth just ended up without its volatile components. In this case, one of the obvious ex potential explanations, the Earth ended up with too much iron. Uh, we would like to say that, but one of the issues with, with iron is that we have core formation, of course. So it's very difficult to distinguish what iron silicate separation occurred in the nebula, and so the whole planet uh, mass balance, versus what had happened after you segregated the iron that was present in the planet and went into the core of the Earth. So what we know is that core formation occurred. We have it. We can see it. It's a missing reservoir geochemically. So you'll hear a lot about that this week. Missing reservoirs are something that we geochemists always appeal to when we can't add things up to the right, you know, get a good mass balance on it. The core is one of those, and you know, luckily seismology sees the core, so it's, it's an acceptable missing reservoir. Uh, so the missing reservoir is, is, explains why these elements aren't plotting on this volatility curve. Here's, again, condensation temperature. This is the volatile elements curve that we saw a few slides ago. Uh, what the 
key is about these elements is that these elements are all soluble in iron uh, metal and they prefer iron metal over silicate. So the fact that they're not lying on, on this volatile depletion trend means that something else has reduced their com composition and these are plotted for mantle compositions. So an obvious possibility for that is that these elements the missing component of these elements isn't present in the mantle, but it's present actually in the core of the Earth. And that we can actually address. We can address the timing of core formation pretty well for a number of ways. And I'll, I'll talk about that some more tomorrow. Uh, today I'll only look at the, the hafnium tungsten system. This is another one of these short-lived isotopes. Nine million year decay of 182 hafnium to 182 tungsten. Hafnium is, is what's known as a lithophile element, meaning it just dissolves in silicates, doesn't dissolve in iron metal at all. Tungsten actually prefers iron metal, although some of it stays in silica, but it, it more prefers uh, the metal. So we can look at this and we can take the hafnium tungsten system and make evolution models like this. So this is time from the beginning of the solar uh, system collapse. We can determine an initial hafnium isotopic composition. This is 182, which is the radiogenic isotope from 184 tungsten, which is a stable isotope. Uh, we get this out of, out of meteorite isochrons. We can look at uh, average chondrites, and they're plotting up here. Both hafnium and tungsten are, are re refractory elements, so they're not fractionated by volatility. They're only fractionated by core formation. They're fractionated by core formation because I mentioned chondrites have a hafnium tungsten ratio of something like one. Hafnium doesn't dissolve in the metal, so the core will have a hafnium tungsten ratio of zero. But the fact that the tungsten does go into the core means that the mantle left over after core formation will have a much higher hafnium tungsten ratio, something like 10. So if you take a starting uh, isotopic composition here and you just let it have a chondritic hafnium tungsten, it evolves up to this point here. So that's if, if no core formation took place. When core formation does take place, what happens is the core stops growing in 182 because the hafnium tungsten ratio is zero. You get a flat line here, but the mantle with a much higher hafnium tungsten grows in much more 182 tungsten. So what we actually have on this plot in terms of data are the initial composition here, chondrite composition here, and what we can measure in the Earth's mantle today. Uh, and from this, then, we can calculate an evolution uh, of core formation that looks like those, those lines. And this gives you a very nice uh, core formation age of 33 plus or minus 2 million years. Uh, you know, it would be nice, again, to say that that's the accuracy represents the precision. But of course, this is a single step of core formation. Uh, it's easy to calculate. It's probably unrealistic physically. So what's more realistic physically is something like this, but it's much more messy uh, computationally, is to think that there's a core forming event basically with every big impact. Now, I showed you in the planetary accumulation models from John Chambers, the latter phases of planetary accumulation are characterized by these huge impacts. So probably with each one of these, there's substantial melting. There's another round of core formation every time one of these large objects come in. And you can sort of get the schematic of that or something like this. You start forming the core right away. So the mantle starts deviating away from the, the chondrite evolution curve here. But as you're going on, you're, you're adding a new, new uh, chondrite every time. So here, you, ha you have an evolution of the mantle. You add a new chondrite to it. It brings you back to here. You have a core forming event. It evolves out here. You add another piece of chondrite, and so on. So you're making this sort of sawtooth curve every time you're adding a new planetesimal to the Earth. Uh, and in this particular model, you end up with a uh, 182 tungsten that's higher than, than the present day Earth. So you have to add something at the very end of this. And this is 100 million years just to model the giant impact for the moon. And we think it may have been delayed by as much as 100 million years. So you can see that a complicated like model like this can still fit the three data points. Now, there are actually ways that we can constrain this. Uh, but the point being here is that we know that core formation occurred early. Whether it occurred 33 plus or minus 2 million years or 100 million years or in little pieces like this, we can't say with certainty. But we know that, again, it's one of those features that was established on Earth very early. Yeah? It's unfortunate if you have three data points. Is there hope to get more? Uh, you give us another data point? Not likely. Uh, what we know, there, there's some interesting variation, 182 tungsten in, in Earth samples now. The cause of it is, is still debated. Uh, there's a chance that it's actually sampling the mantle before we added some more siderophiles on, which is my next slide. Uh, the chondrite numbers we know pretty well. And there's been some, some range in this because of not accounting for cosmic ray effects and stuff. But these two numbers are known about as well as I think we're going to know them. Uh, and I don't see us improving on that greatly. So at least in these models, I think we're stuck. But there are three other isotope systems that you can use for exactly the same thing that I'll go over in my talk tomorrow that can constrain this, I think, much, much more tightly.
So I mentioned already to Michael's question is that, uh, so we have this core forming event that segregates these elements. And one of the issues that's been for a long time is that there are these uh, groups of elements called the highly siderophile elements, uh, things like platinum, palladium, osmium, iridium, the things that really like to be in iron metal. They, they have distribution coefficients between metal and silicate liquid of something like 10 to the 5, 10 to the 7 even. So they basically would be quantitatively stripped from the mantle if the mantle was in chemical e equilibrium with the core. So these, here you see, this is what the predicted uh, concentrations in the mantle would be if the core were in equilibrium with the mantle. But when you look at the mantle, they actually have uh, highly siderophile element concentrations up here. They're about uh, uh, a factor 200 less than chondrites, they're more or less in chondritic relative abundances to one another, even though they're, they're depleted relative to chondrites. So there's only two explanations for this. One is, is that these distribution coefficients are wrong. They're measured at uh, low pressures and, and moderate temperatures. So if we increase the pressure and temperature, thinking about core formation in a, in a big growing earth, these might actually rise, and they, and they do seem to rise at higher pressure. But whether they rise not only to this level, but whether they all rise to exactly that level, I think is, is unclear. So the fact, uh, the other way to get this, this nice distribution is actually to add some chondrite to the earth after core formation has occurred. These elements are so abundant in, the, in chondrites relative to the, the mantle that's left over after core formation, it doesn't take much chondrite to balance out these, these abundances, basically overwhelm what's in the, in the mantle and leave you with these flat patterns. It takes something like 1% of the mass of the, the earth of, a, of some type of chondrite to bring these abundances up to this level. Now, uh, one other thing, this 1% number is an interesting number because if you think about 1% of an earth mass of a CI chondrite, which is a particular type of chondrite that has a lot of water in it, something like 18% weight percent water, it brings in something of the order of 10 to the 21 kilograms, uh, and the, today's oceans are about 10 to the 21 kilograms. So this late veneer, it's called, this late addition after core formation, uh, s seems to be required to explain the highly siderophile elements. It also could bring in all the earth's water, although it doesn't have to because CI chondrites, there are many other chondrites that will have the right abundances of highly siderophile elements that won't have any water. So you could bring in the late veneer that doesn't bring in water. But I think it's curious that uh, you actually could bring in an ocean's mass of water uh, with this, the, uh, this late veneer. And I'm way over time already, Dave, so. Uh, it's not over time, it's no. been interrupted. Okay. Wait, I have a question. Yeah. Can you tell us more about these mantle samples? These. Uh, these uh, represent kind of an average of every piece of mantle that we can get our hands on, everything from orogenic peridotites, uh, ophiolites, uh, orogenic peridotites that are tectonic slices of the mantle, mantle xenoliths. The actual variation in these in the mantle samples that we have is not huge. So uh, I, I think these numbers are among the best numbers I've shown, shown you so far in this talk. So, so did we get lucky? With? To uh, get late veneered with uh, this... Uh, <laughs> Well, I think late, late veneer is a consequence of the way that planets accumulate. Is that uh, you know we always think that the end of planetary accumulation is on like like Mark said, it's on December 31st, right? It's not that way. Is that probably there's this mass decline, so there's a lot of mass in the early days, and there's this continual trend. And I think what's what this is showing is that there's a point where the mass accumulation per time is so high that you're getting continual magma oceans, you're getting continual core segregations, and that's where you're establishing core mantle equilibrium for these elements. But at some stage, the mass input is starting to get to the point where you're not disturbing the Earth's temperature uh, to that degree, and what you're adding at the surface is staying at the surface or being mixed just in the mantle, and you're no longer getting exchange between core and mantle. I, I so, guess my water is more, my question yeah. Mars would lose water just because of its gravity, but uh, yeah. So this may have happened on the body, but Yeah, I mean, there is a late veneer even on the moon. I mean, you can see it in impact breaches and the like. So the late veneer is, is a real phenomena. I think the important question is in this one is what this implies is that the late veneer was added after core mantle equilibrium was achieved. So this is telling you that, that the core and the mantle are not in chemical equilibrium with one another, at, at least for, for groups of elements like this. Why? 
Well, Sujo, I'll be going through this with, with the atmosphere. I'll be going through it with, with palladium silver, too. It turns out palladium silver, can another short-lived isotope system, can address this. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that's suggesting that there was a change in composition during planetary, during Earth growth. So starting from a volatile, depleted material and moving to, to a more oxidized, more volatile, rich material. But that's the detail I'll, I'll, I'll get into tomorrow. Matt? Yeah, the, yeah. I mean, this question of when when did it become this homogeneous? I mean, Barbara asked the, the right question: is these are numbers from modern day mantle samples. So, if we had samples of the mantle from 3.8 billion years ago, 3 billion years ago, would the mantle look like this? Um, that's a question that I think we are just now beginning to be able to address. With particularly, like there there are there are tungsten isotope variations in old mantle derived rocks that. Are, there's a long, complicated story about what it means that I don't even think we know what it really means yet, but it's suggesting that we are seeing the initial heterogeneity post-core formation. Gee. I don't think so. Bill, the, you're... You're the master of this. I think that's at the right level. I just had to make one wood paper in 2006 and started at much lower. It's close to 0.01. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. Well, that may be one of it. But yeah, I, I don't know what the answer to that is. Yeah. All righty. So, uh, so we know volatile depletion and core formation occurred pretty early. Uh, so that leads us to what, what happened to the silicate earth. Uh, the silicate earth, we're going to look at a bunch of elements that are called refractory lithophile elements. Don't you, don't you love geochemistry, right? So refractory obviously means that they're not volatile. Lithophile means that they prefer silicate over metal. That's all, that's all that means. So these groups of elements won't be fractionated by core formation, nor they, will they be fractionated by volatile laws. Uh, and in fact, they follow those laws. This is uh, two of them, samarium and neodymium. These are two neighboring rare earth elements. They happen, happen to have two isotope systems embedded in them, and it's what I do for a living. So you'll see a lot of, lot of these plots. But uh, the point being is the samarium neodymium ratio is a measure of two nearby uh, refractory lithophile elements. If they were strongly fractionated from one another by nebular processes, you would see that meteorites would range all over the place in samarium neodymium ratio. But in fact, they describe a range of only something like 3%. So this meets our expectation that these refractory lithophile elements are not fractionated by the kind of nebular process we've been talking about, uh, iron, iron silicate separation nor volatile, uh, volatile refractory separation. Uh, but when we look at the Earth, uh, we look at our, our crust, uh, those elements, in fact, aren't present in, in chondritic abundances. Uh, so here's a pattern. Uh, these are listed now in order. their incompatibility during melting the mantle. So these are the most incompatible elements at this end and the least incompatible elements at this end of the diagram. If we start with a, a mantle that has a perfectly flat pattern, so uh, thinking of like a chondrite abundance of, the, of these elements, and we melt it, we get melts, especially at low degrees, that are highly enriched in the incompatible elements and not so enriched in the, in the moderately in, incompatible elements. Uh, that's what the continental crust looks like. I mean, this is a very simplified uh, explanation for continental crust formation, but the point being is basically the continental crust is a it's, if you will, it's a distillation product out of the mantle. It's in some a very low degree of partial melt of the mantle. Uh, it's been uh, brought to the surface of the earth. It's been sitting there for a long time, so it's held out of the mantle circulation. And what happened, because it's been extracted from the mantle, is that the mantle that makes oceanic crust looks more like this. So it is basically the chemical complement to this. Uh, so the continental crust extraction has left behind a depleted portion of the mantle. Uh, that doesn't have chondritic abundances of these elements. And those are the two pieces, two types of crust that we have on Earth, continental crust and uh, oceanic crust, neither one of which appear to be from a, a mantle that has a source composition like we would expect for primordial mantle. So this has led to this model that's been around, I think, 30, 35 years now, where you start with some primitive mantle that does have chondritic abundances of these elements. You allow it to partial melt. You segregate out a small volume of continental crust. It's only half a percent of the mass of the Earth. And you leave behind a depleted mid-ocean ridge basalt mantle that may be uh, a third to, to more than half the mantle, depending on how you do the mass balance calculations. One of our tutorials is on these mass balance calculations. But then the rest of the mantle is, is this primitive composition. Uh, what I would like to focus on for this deep time story actually is whether this primitive uh, composition really is what we would expect for the bulk earth composition. Is it a chondritic composition or was this in fact a fractionated uh, 
uh, material before this, this process started. There's no question that this is occurring. The question is what happened to this and whether this really is primitive or not. We can ask the question when, when this separation occurred, and we can approach that. All, there's all sorts of radioactive elements in this list, so we can apply many isotope methods to determine when this occurred. We can do Samaritan Indian model ages for the mid-ocean ridge basalt source, or 200 to 2 billion years. So you can, again, this is not an accurate uh, approach to this. Lead model ages, 1,800 million years. Average continental crust ages, 2 billion years. Now, these aren't dating discrete events. So the continental crust didn't just pop out of the mantle 2 billion years ago. What this is probably dating is a more or less continuous process process over Earth history, although rates of it are, are subject to considerable debate. But the point being is this is not a phenomena that one would associate with Earth formation. This is something that's been going on in a dynamic Earth throughout Earth history. So we want to see what happened before that. Within the Samaritan Didim uh, uh, so, okay. so within the Samaritan Nadimian system, we actually have two uh, systems. I showed you the 147, the case of 143, Nidemi has a 100 billion year half-life. 142 is produced by a short-lived isotope. 146, Samarium, is like a 68 uh, million year half-life. Uh, so what we did a few years ago is look, and if you look at chondritic meteorites, most of these actually have 142, 144 ratios lower than the modern terrestrial value. So the mo basically all modern terrestrial rocks have a value within that, that blue bar there. Uh, some ensotite chondrites overlap, but by far the majority uh, plot to lower 142 nedimium values. So 142 nedimium is, is made by the decay of 146 samarium. So the fact that the Earth has a higher 142 than these chondrites could suggest that the Earth had a high samarium nedimium ratio while 146 samarium was still alive. And with a half-life like this, you're talking three or four half-lives. So you're talking two or three hundred million years after solar system formation. After that time, this is dead, and anything you do to the Samarium Nadimim ratio won't affect 142 Nadimim anymore. So what you're looking at here is something that was established very early in Earth history. So that implies that the Samarium Nadimim ratio of the Earth might be higher than chondritic by something like 6%. So if you think about that, this is 143 nadimium. Because you're dealing with samarium nadimium, uh, uh, you'll, you'll affect both decay systems at the same time. Uh, so a chondritic samarium nadimium ratio would end up with a 143, 144 down here. Uh, if you have this non-chondritic, this 6% higher than chondritic value, you'll end up with isotopic compositions up here in the nadimium space. This is a plot of helium 3-4 ratio, another measure of, of primitiveness in the mantle, if you will, uh, because helium-3 is a, is a primordial rare gas, hasn't been produced just a little bit by radioactive uh, uh, materials, but helium-4, of course, is an alpha particle produced by all sorts of radioactive decays. So this has been going down with time. So the, the thinking about a primordial reservoir then is the higher the value is here, the more primordial it is. And when you look at the uh, data for ocean island basalts, this, this is from Matt, uh, Matt Jackson's work, actually. I, Matt, I'm sorry, I, I erased your name down here. Uh, the, you see what the, the helium-3-4 ratio, actually the highest values are in this region that you would expect for these nadimium isotopic compositions that are not chondritic. So again, this is suggesting that this thing that we've been calling primitive mantle for a very long time, in fact, it's a non-chondritic composition that may have been formed by events early in Earth history. All right, so all, all the non-geochemists in the audience are probably sitting there. This guy's talking about these strange elements. I don't know what are rare earths. I don't care. They're not very abundant. You know, what's the big deal here? The big deal is that these elements are also the, uh, contain all the heat-producing elements in the Earth. So if you think about the conventional model, we have a continental crust here has a pattern like that. This, uh, it's a very small mass uh, compared to the Earth. It's only half, the half a percent of the mass of the Earth. It produces seven terawatts of, of radioactive decay presently based on these uranium, thorium, potassium abundances. Uh, you have the mid-ocean ridge basalt source. It's very depleted in these elements, so it produces almost no radiogenic heat in the modern world. And then if you take these in a ratio, that, let's say this is 30% of the Earth, then you have the primitive chondritic mantle that produces something like 12 uh, terawatts. So you combine all these up, you're talking something like 20 terawatts of, of uh, radioactive heat producing uh, in, in, in those compositions. On the other hand, if the Earth has this non-chondritic composition, something like this, you're talking something about 12 terawatts. So you're lowering the heat producing element abundances by something like 60% like of what they would be in a chondritic model. This is going to have uh, large consequences for internal heating and geodynamic models, for example, uh, and uh, you know, could, so could affect your calculations on, on uh, mantle geodynamics. But the other issue here is that if the Earth, in fact, as a whole, has chondritic abundances of these elements, and we have to worry about how they might be fractionated, you should end up with a pattern like that. So if the Earth that we can sample has a pattern like that, there must be something else in the Earth that has a complementary pattern to this. Now, we don't know where it is, how big it is, but 
if we guess how big it is, we can calculate its concentration. That's what we'll be doing in the mass balance tutorial. So if it's the whole mantle under 1,600 kilometers, I saw Louise here. This is the Kellogg et al. stealth layer from a few years ago. So this is a mantle beneath 1,600 kilometers. Might be compositionally different. This is what its composition would be for these elements. If it's as small as a D double prime, it has an enrichment like this. So basically, you see that if you can concentrate this sort of uh, complementary reservoir to this early depleted reservoir into a very small volume of the mantle, you're talking about storing something at the bottom of the earth that basically has the same heat producing capability as the continental crust. Rick? Yeah? Did you want to talk about the collision erosion alternative hypothesis? I'm, I'm getting there. Where yeah. Where does potassium What's that? Where would potassium be for the continental crust and the uh, Sorry. Oh, it's not on this list. Uh, potassium, where is it built? In here. Yeah, no, yeah, it would, it would plot along these lines in here. So, so I mean, the, num the actual concentrations are shown out here. I, just, I didn't plot them in the normalized diagram. Sorry. All righty. So, so the question then is, how does this come about? Uh, we've talked about core formation, about magma oceans. So one option is that we had a magma ocean that differentiated, formed a crust. Uh, we know that that's not the crust that we're talking about because the only thing we have on the Earth has this positive 142 Nidimium anomaly. This would have the negative 142 Nidimium anomaly. So we have to get rid of it so we can put it down at D double prime. Uh, that's one option. The other way is this model from Labrosse a few years ago where you, have, uh, you take uh, account of the increased compressibility of liquids, uh, silicate as opposed to solid silicate. So if you had a magma ocean, it starts crystallizing from the middle out instead of the, the bottom up. So you basically you form two uh, differentiated liquids, one at the top, one at the bottom. So you end up with a basal magma layer like this. I'm zipping through this because I'm, I'm eating into Dave's time, I'm sure. Uh, but the point of this is that you have these models where you, you need to explain this presence of this, this missing reservoir that has all these heat producing elements in it. And like the core, where you can see it in, in geophysics, you wonder whether these things, these large low shear velocity promises mapped out in, uh, from this Ed Granero's review paper here, uh, whether these are in fact uh, an early differentiation product or instead like in a cartoon here whether these are the you know sort of the accumulated piles of, of modern subducted oceanic basalts for example we don't know the answer to that we know that they're compositionally distinct and it's an important question whether these are just you know the products of modern plate tectonics or in fact whether these things might have been formed four and a half billion years ago Bill brings up the collisional erosion. Uh, the other way that you can do this and not have this missing reservoir is to assume that the Earth doesn't have chondritic abundances of these elements. But you don't have a nebular mechanism to get rid of them, or at least an obvious one, except this one. So here's a pretty, you know, pretty painting of what might happen in a big impact. So there's all this stuff that gets thrown out. This you've probably seen before. This is Robin Knup's models of what happens in a, in a giant impact. So there's the impactor comes in, sort of tears itself apart, cuts off the top of the Earth, starts going into orbit here. And the purpose of these models was to explain how you can get enough mass into orbit around the Earth to form the moon. But what I would like to uh, use this for is to point out that most of this stuff actually ends up back in the Earth. It just is gravitationally captured and ends up back in the Earth. Some small fraction of it might end up forming the moon, but some fraction of it leaves the system. So it becomes gravitationally unbound from the Earth, Earth moon system, and you could lose it. So if you preferentially lost a crustal component to a planetesimal that's growing, this of course is much easier when you're talking about small planetesimals, then you have the opportunity to sort of lose this, uh, this reservoir that we don't seem to have on the Earth. Dave, I, I've got a few more, but I'm going to stop at this point and I think let you take over if you're, you're willing. So, well, Dave is setting himself up, I'll remind you, the cider's been going on for a week already, and there were eight talks. Uh, Dave, you can go ahead and get started. Uh, there were eight talks last week. So Rick has told you the facts, and I will give the fiction or fantasy. Oh, the physics, that's right.
So my intent here is to give you a very broad brush overview of the physical considerations that go into thinking about deep time. And I have chosen to divide it into three aspects. The formation, the initial condition for the Earth that emerges from that formation process, and a few words about how you transition from that to a recognizable world, by which I mean an Earth that looks vaguely like our current Earth, mostly solid in the mantle, uh, perhaps with plate tectonics, with a dynamo, and so forth. And of course, an important part of formation and initial condition is the thermodynamic state. In the case of formation, the question of where the material comes from, the time scales over which things happen, the energy that's released. In the case of initial condition, uh, the core formation, magma ocean, whether you have an ocean and atmosphere, the healing has to do with the solidification, uh, <coughs> the onset of a dynamo, mantle convection, continents, and plate tectonics. And of course, the way one should think about this is that in some multi-dimensional space, we go from an initial condition along some evolutionary path to the present state. And it's important to keep in mind that when talking about the initial condition, the information that we're going to use should come and does come in part from astronomy, from thinking about how planetary systems form. And we do have quite a bit of information about that. And in fact, the information in that area is exploding. But of course, we have information from geochemistry, and we use physical modeling as well. And then along the evolutionary path, the constraints do come from geochemistry, geology, and geobiology. <clears throat> Geophysics is really, I would say, focused on the present state. Now, I know, of course, that geophysicists also work on the evolutionary path. But when you think about the things that geophysicists actually measure, <clears throat> including things like heat flow, which you can think of as a measurement of some uh, derivative at this present state, the fact remains that the present state is uh, defined in significant part by geophysical measurements such as those from seismology. Another important point to keep in mind is that when you think about geologic time, at least in the context of uh, the deep time aspect, it's important to think about time in a logarithmic sense, as I've shown here, in which case, of course, the Phanerozoic is just a small piece of this <clears throat> infinite line. And you can think of zero, which is way off to the left, as the uh, initial collapse from the interstellar medium. But the reason why this is a useful way to think about time is because a lot of things happen over a relatively short time, and they have profound influence on everything that happens subsequently. <clears throat> so, in respect of formation, the question is what should you believe? That is, what, what is rather well established, and what should you think of as just this week's story, by which I mean, if you came to a meeting like this in a decade, would, would you hear a different story? <clears throat> now, the context of making the solar system and making the Earth, I would say is actually quite well established. We know from looking at the interstellar medium and from looking at its dynamics and composition that it makes sense that you will have gravitational collapse, that you will tend to form a system that is about the size of ours. There's a reason for that. It's not purely arbitrary. And you will tend to make a disk that has roughly cosmic or solar composition, and that is reflected in, in our instance with the abundances in the sun, which we can measure to a fairly good accuracy, and the measurements of meteorites, which are uh, very similar, except for some of the volatile elements. And so we think that we understand that you get roughly the uh, necessary material. That is to say, the disk is several to 10% the mass of the star, the sun that forms from it, and that is roughly the right amount of material to explain the, the planets that we see. Perhaps a little bit more than what we need, meaning that some of it is lost into the sun and some of it is ejected. Um, and of course most of the gas is ejected. And it is roughly in the right place. Uh, that is to say, you can understand the location of where the terrestrial planets will form, 
But, and here's an important point, the terrestrial planets are actually a sideshow. They really are, because most of the action is out with the giant planets, and the giant planets are determining the environment in which the terrestrial planets form. I, I say this for our solar system, there are some possibly different stories that may apply for the planetary systems that we're finding uh, around other stars. And of course, from this disk of gas and dust emerges planetesimals, 10, 100 kilometers in size. It's embarrassing to admit, but true, that we actually don't understand how planetesimals form. It's clear they form quickly. Meteorite record, chronology that Rick talked about makes it clear that that happened. Uh, and it's likely that uh, gravity is involved in that process, not just sticking, but the details are still hotly debated. Once that happens, things go fast, and that is understood in a theoretical sense, meaning time scales of a million years, and that's reflected in the uh, isotopic measurements. However, the process of going from small bodies to things the size of the Earth slows down as time progresses because bodies get isolated and they have to perturb each other gravitationally to produce crossing orbits, so the end game stretches out to 100 million years. It's important to understand that from a theoretical point of view, many of these timescales are quite poorly known Typically, they're known to only about a factor of two or so. That actually matters because the question of when the nebula leaves, for example, is of importance. And astronomy tells us something about that, but with limited precision because unlike what geochemists do, the astronomers are limited in part to statistical inferences about time. They don't have absolute measurements of time. And indeed it is the case that this week's story may not be next week's story. That is to say, the whole business of the details of how the planet was put together are in flux. The story that you hear uh, right now is different from the story that you would have heard a decade ago and therefore presumably different from the story you will hear a decade from now. So to give you an example of that, Uh, here is something very recent. It's called the Grand TAC. Uh, it comes from Kevin Walsh working with people. It's part of ancillary to what is called the NICE model. It's not the NICE model, but it is uh, uh, involving many of the same characters. And what you see in this diagram, I will run the uh, simulation in a moment, is the giant planets, because the giant planets are the things that really matter. We're just details. The Earth is just a detail. Uh, but what you're going to notice is that these blue dots, which you can think of as ice balls, they're icy planetesimals, do get intermingled with the red dots, which are the uh, less ice-rich bodies that form in the inner part of the solar system. And what you're going to see over a relatively short time scale is a dramatic evolution of the four orbits, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. if I can figure out how to, oops, uh, there we go. And I want you to notice that the blue and the red things get mixed in the inner region. So what's happening here is that there's a rapid evolution of the orbits. This is in a period when the gas is still present. Jupiter and Saturn move a lot. They then get into a resonance and they expand back out. One of the interesting things about the story, aside from the fact that it may actually provide Earth's water, is that it turns out that this story can uh, explain why Mars is special. It may explain why Mars is isolated and does not participate in the main part of the uh, accretion of the bodies. Now, Rick showed you this. This is from John Chambers. And... The point I want to make about this evolution, in addition to what Rick said, is that the initial condition for this evolution is not arbitrary. There is a reason why you start out with objects that are roughly Mars mass down to uh, lunar mass, and that has to do with isolation of the orbits and orbit crossing. Uh, So this is not completely arbitrary. It's not chosen so that you get the final terrestrial planets that we get. Uh, 
to some extent it is. That is to say, if you run it many times, you get different outcomes. But the idea that you start out with objects in this range is a natural thing, and so you have these big things colliding. And the fact that you've got small guys is also required and expected and is needed to explain the outcome of the system in terms of eccentricity and inclination. Uh, these objects down here are needed. They provide a uh, dynamical friction that goes into uh, determining the final dynamic state. So the important point about this is that you do have giant impacts. Giant impacts involving objects like the forming Earth colliding with bodies about the mass of Mars. And I want to stress this is not arbitrary. There's, there are very good reasons why this is a natural outcome of the process, in many ways an unavoidable aspect of the process. These events are extraordinary. They produce very high temperatures. They cause the Earth to radiate like a low-mass star for several thousand years. Um, and if you have an oblique impact, you can place material in Earth orbit and produce the moon. Uh, Rick showed Robin Canup's simulation of that process. And uh, I will talk about the thermodynamic state in, in a moment. So the question is about uh, whether the Earth is completely molten. The answer, I believe, is yes. But I, I will say more about that. I will talk also more about that on Wednesday. So giant impacts are an essential part of Earth formation. It's not just the lunar forming impact. You must not think of the giant impact as some special thing at the end of Earth evolution. It's a natural part of the process and uh, must be taken into account in, in thinking about the thermodynamics of the initial state. Dave, from, from the talks I've been hearing about the grand attack recently, it's sounding like giant impacts are less frequent in the grand attack scenario than in previous not absent, but, but, but fewer of them. Yes, that's possible. Although, um, uh, keep in mind that I showed you the grand tack not because I believe it, but just to give you a feeling of this week's flavor. <laughs> <coughs> so giant impacts are an essential part of Earth formation, not just the lunar forming impact. Small impactors are essential. They're contemporaneous. Could be 20%, could be 40% of the total mass. We don't really know. That depends on the details. Much of the Earth could actually have formed quickly, perhaps in as little as 3 million years. A lot of the action is early on. But because of the tendency to isolate the embryos and because of the need to stir them up by gravitational interaction and produce crossing orbits, the whole process spreads out to take finally 30 to 100 million years with considerable uncertainty about when the last event is. It's important to keep in mind that all of this activity towards the end has to happen after Jupiter formed because Jupiter had to form in the presence of the nebula and in fact Jupiter plays a major role in setting up the architecture of the solar system and of course uh, this is well after the formation of the solar nebula. So. Although the early part of formation of the Earth would have been in the presence of the hydrogen-rich nebula, uh, the latter stages are not. Now, often when people talk about formation of the Earth these days, they ignore the issue of what hydrogen, uh, what role hydrogen might have played. I think that is still an open question. Uh, it is still possible that uh, when people talk about neon isotopes, for example, it's not, it's not clear in the case of hydrogen. It's still possible that there's an imprint of the nebula directly through the gas phase because uh, bodies the size of Mars can certainly form in those first few million years and the nebula is still around and there will actually be a hydrogen gas uh, uh, gravitationally bound onto those embryos. Dave, yes? In this decade, you're currently but I don't want to oversell it, to uh, an earlier Jupiter <coughs> formation as opposed to a contemporaneous Jupiter terrestrial planet formation? Yes, uh, although I, I would also put that in the category of this week's story. Right. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's useful to know which things are firmly based and which things may change. And I, so I want to tell you about both. Uh, 
Now, one of the things that Rick mentioned, and I think is quite likely, is that as the Earth accretes, you accumulate material from different parts of the system, and that means a change in provenance, a change perhaps in oxidation state and in volatiles with time. But I would say that at present, it's difficult to quantify exactly uh, the extent to which that would be true. The amount of water is highly uncertain. In the case of the Grand Tack, as I mentioned, it's possible that water is part of the primary accretion. Uh, to me, that's a perfectly reasonable idea, but that doesn't mean that all of the water was available as part of the initial accretion. A significant part of it may be late. One of the interesting issues, uh, Rick talked about this, is the question of mixing. By, by mixing, I mean to what extent is the material that goes into the Earth the material that accumulated near Earth orbit and to what extent does it come from great distance away from Earth orbit? That is still an open question. Uh, there is clearly some mixing, but the extent is uncertain, and that is something uh, that could be well part of this week's story. Some important numbers to keep in mind, and I will come back to this on Wednesday when I talk uh, in more detail about these things, is that the energy of formation of the Earth is huge. Gravitational energy really dominates this story. Uh, so if you take the energy per unit mass of the Earth, which is capital G times the mass of the Earth divided by the radius, and divide that by the specific heat of rock or iron, it doesn't matter much, you get 40,000 degrees. Now, of course, this is, a, this is a fictional number. It's not what actually happens. But it's a way of thinking about the energy of Earth formation this is an order of magnitude large, larger than all of the radioactive heat generated throughout all of Earth history. So this is a huge energy source. And in fact, you can express it in terms of the latent heat of vaporization of rock. And what this number tells you, this dimensionless number tells you that there was enough energy in Earth formation to vaporize everything. That's not what happened, but it's a way of thinking about the energy budget. It is, of course, true that sigma t to the fourth cooling, radiative cooling, can be efficient. So were you to take all the energy of Earth formation and try to eliminate it by uh, radiation into space steadily over 100 million years, you would only get 400 Kelvin. So it is indeed true that if you made the Earth from dust and you did it gently and slowly over 100 million years, you can keep the system cold. But of course, that's a ridiculous physical model. You can't do that. And the reality is that you're going to have infrequent large impacts. You're going to have a steam atmosphere. Here's an example of what happens in a giant impact. This is actually uh, my own work with a student at Caltech, Miki Nakajima. And so these are SPH calculations. Plotted here is the entropy of the material in the Earth and the disk that forms as the Earth is hit uh, by a Mars-sized body. So this green part is the planet. The red part is the disk, radius, and Earth radii. So the Earth's surface is here. You may not recall what typical entropy numbers are for the present Earth. People often don't think about entropy, but they should. Entropy is much more important than temperature. You must think about entropy because that's more nearly conserved. Temperature can vary all over the place depending on the pressure at which you ask what uh, temperature corresponds to it. Uh, but these entropies deep in the mantle are, in fact, enhanced in the giant impact by more the en than the entropy of fusion, that is to say the material gets molten. Now there may be a small amount that survives melting, it will tend to get mixed in with the stuff uh, that is not molten, but this is a very hot state. Uh, by the way, it is stably stratified, that is to say it will not necessarily mix well. The highest entropies, as you might expect in an impact event, are at the surface uh, the entropies are roughly constant in the disk, highly variable because the disk is made up of materials that come from different parts in the impact event. But the Earth is molten after a giant impact, the mantle is stably stratified, uh, and the disk is partly vaporized rock. In this context, one must of course think about core formation as being in an entirely molten system. 
And here I'm talking about the additions to the core that occur during a giant impact. So this is the core of the projectile, which then gets broken up into blobs that will only partly equilibrate because they can get to the core in literally hours. It only takes a few hours to get this stuff from high up down to the core. This is a hotly debated topic at the moment, that is to say to what extent this material does mix efficiently. And of course, if it mixes down to droplets, which eventually it will do if it has enough time, then it can equilibrate by diffusion, even though the core formation process may only take a few uh, thousand years. Uh, Dave Ruby and, and I will talk about this a bit later uh, uh, at this meeting. So there may be imperfect equilibration, and uh, that means that it's difficult to make a connection as people would like to between the hafnium tungsten isotopic system and the timing of core formation. Uh, and it's also difficult to make a connection between the temperature and pressure conditions that this material encounters, very high temperature, very high pressure, and the equilibration that is expressed in the mantle that's left behind, as people like to do. I know this is an unpopular story uh, because people would like to think that it looks more like one of these cartoons, uh, which is simpler to understand. In this kind of cartoon, two versions shown here, core formation comes about through an equilibration process between droplets of iron and the molten mantle adjacent to it, then the aggregation of iron, which then finds its way to the core, perhaps through Rayleigh-Taylor instabilities, maybe even through cracks if it were partly solid, uh, and maybe even partly through percolation. Uh, I think Dave Ruby will talk a little bit about that. Um, but this kind of cartoon is also relevant because, of course, after a giant impact, the Earth actually heals rather quickly before the next giant impact. And so between giant impacts and after the giant impacts, the, this kind of cartoon still has some relevance. And so part of the core formation process uh, will be something like this. Uh, these cartoons are wrong in detail. Uh, as Rick mentioned, and as we will talk uh, later in the meeting, there is also the possibility of a basal magma ocean immediately above the core and uh, the possibility of a continuing uh, core mantle uh, interaction. And of course, in a magma ocean, what happens is that you're cooling at a prodigious rate out through the top you're starting to crystallize both in the middle region and perhaps towards the bottom. And uh, in this turbulent convecting system, you may mix for a while, but then after a while, it will start to separate liquid from solid by a percolative process. And so there is the possibility of setting, setting up layering. It's not clear whether that layering will persist. So the initial condition, the main points are that everything's melted, there's some vaporization, core formation is contemporaneous with accretion. That does not exclude some later core mantle interaction. And I think this is a very interesting issue, both from a geochemical point of view and from a geodynamic point of view, because this interaction can affect the composition of the core, that can affect the timing of the uh, uh, inner core nucleation, um, it will affect the entire thermal history of the Earth and the history of the geodynamo. The rapid cooling that happens early on will cause partial crystallization of the magma ocean. Once freezing has uh, uh, continued to a, a large extent, then there may be a mantle turnover, as Lindy elkins tanton has suggested. I think this is an open question because the dynamics of this system are still not that well understood. Uh, it's not clear that you get complete mixing of the mantle. It's not clear uh, whether that mixing can mix in the basal magma ocean. In the giant impact scenarios that I talked about, a basal magma ocean before the giant impact may not get mixed up by the giant impact. So this is a reservoir that could be of relevance for understanding the Neodymium 142 story that uh, Rick talked about. 
That is to say, there could be a reservoir within the Earth that survives the giant impacts, despite the fact that the Earth is completely molten. People sometimes make the mistake of thinking, oh, if it's completely molten, it'll be well mixed. That is not correct. Uh, there are many uncertainties in the dynamics and the material properties, phase diagrams, partitioning. I've been saying for years we have to understand the, the partitioning down at the core mantle boundary conditions. That's a crucial thing. I know it's hard to do, but that's a, a, a crucial thing for geochemistry. I would include this in, in mineral physics. I think it's a mineral physics issue. Um, there is large uncertainty in the timing and the amount of volatiles, but they may have mostly been delivered early. I, I have no problem with the idea of multiple uh, oceans uh, equivalent of water being delivered early. That doesn't mean that there wasn't also water delivered late. Uh, this material is not removed by a giant impact. You cannot devolatilize the earth by a giant impact. You can devolatilize a little bit of it, but the stuff that's dissolved in the magma ocean like water will in large part stay there. If you blew away a steam atmosphere from the earth, the magma ocean would simply replace it. And this water is not coming from comets. There's not enough from comets. As for the hydrosphere and atmosphere, uh, initially, of course, you have the silicate vapor, but that's very short-lived, just thousands of years. You would then have a steam atmosphere. To sustain the steam atmosphere, as in the models of Abi and Matsui, you need the, on, the continuation of accretion. If accretion dies off, uh, perhaps even during giant impacts, the steam atmosphere will collapse, and it will collapse on a geologically short time scale. There can, of course, be much more water in the magma ocean. Some of that water will come out as the magma ocean crystallizes. Uh, and uh, maybe Mark Hirschman will talk about this, but the composition of the primordial atmosphere has to be determined by the oxidation state. I don't think the water cycle is that well understood. Dave, when you say steam atmosphere, this is referring to all the volatile species or water in particular? And does it matter? Uh, Steam, so I'm not sure what the question is. The steam atmosphere is not just steam, but, but that, that would be the main component, I guess. And the importance that it's radiatively... Oh, oh, so, so the important thing about steam atmosphere is that it's opaque over a range of conditions uh, such that the magma ocean is protected. Now, actually, water starts to be transparent again um, when the temperatures are high enough. Uh, but there's a range of conditions where you're radiating to space at, say, uh, three or 400 Kelvin, and the surface of the Earth is 1,500 Kelvin. That intervening steam atmosphere is opaque. So it's a very good greenhouse situation. But it's transient because um, it, it requires energy from below. Remember that in ordinary greenhouse effect, what you're relying on is uh, sunlight getting through. In this case, that's not likely to be enough. You still need the input of energy from accretion. Uh, so it's like a conventional greenhouse effect, except that the input energy is accretion rather than sunlight. Uh, let's see. Yeah. What does it mean when you say that momentum convection is deterministic? Okay, so why do we have plate tectonics? I don't know. That's the reason for putting the slide here. I do not know why we have plate tectonics. And I, and, and I want to say that because I often get the impression that people think we understand plate tectonics. We do not. Mantle convection is deterministic in the sense that if I give you a set of material parameters, I can tell you a criterion for whether or not it will happen. So there's a well-defined procedure for deciding whether you have mantle convection. That's all I meant. For example, a Rayleigh number. You can't do that for plate tectonics. Uh, it's not a mandatory process. It is more efficient for removing heat, but there's no variational principle that says you have to optimize heat delivery. And we don't know whether it is a deterministic or contingent behavior. By contingent, I simply mean that the... Uh, Conditions for having it happen may depend on history. Uh, mantle convection is deterministic, but there are many dynamical systems involving climate change and dynamos and so forth, which are to some extent contingent. Of course, the history of mantle convection can still be uh, 
uh, chaotic, that is to say it can have a complicated dynamical history. Um, and I think the whole issue of plate tectonics is of course relevant to understanding continental evolution and since we don't really understand plate tectonics, we're stuck from a theoretical point of view in figuring this out. What does seem likely is that water matters, water lubricates the xenosphere, defines the plates, the maintenance of water depends on subduction. Uh, the Earth does seem somewhat special in this regard. As for the magnetic field, of course, we're all familiar with the idea that a uh, magnetic field can arise through dynamo action in the core and that it, uh, the most likely way to have that happen is through convection. The fascinating thing, I've always found this fascinating about planets in general, is that when you look at the terrestrial planets, it's a close call. What I mean by that is that if you change the conditions in the Earth's core, for example, change the thermal conductivity by a factor of two, or electrical conductivity amounts to the same thing through the wiedemann franz law, you can turn the dynamo off. That's amazing to me. Just a factor of two can take you all the way from this vigorous dynamo that we have to no dynamo at all. And that's a warning that we need to understand the composition, we need to understand the light elements, uh, and, and of course this is tied into the question of inner core nucleation, which people think of as a way of maintaining uh, the convection through a compositional effect, but we don't know when that happened. Perhaps on the earliest Earth, what was important was the fact that the Earth's core started out very hot, and in the giant impact stories that I told you about, uh, that's, that's a natural thing to have happen. I know what, yeah. Can you explain the last slide? Rob? <laughs> so we can talk about this later in the week, but the idea is that in order to maintain the dynamo, you have to cool from a hot initial core down to uh, something like what we have now, and it is above the adiabat that you would get if you went from the current mantle down to the core. So the core is superheated in that sense. It has a higher entropy than iron would have in the current mantle of the Earth, and of course that's expressed in significant part by the temperature drop between the core and the mantle, uh, which some people like to think of as a thermal boundary layer. I think it's unlikely that it's just a thermal boundary layer. But my point in putting this slide in here is simply that this is an essential part of understanding how the dynamo is uh, sustained. If you started the temperature of the core out uh, with the mantle, then you would have trouble keeping it going. Oh, well, percolation would tend to produce a core that would be in firm equilibrium with the, with the mantle. I'm saying that it, it, it can start out hotter than the mantle in the giant impact story. So what about the transition to a recognizable world? Main points, rapid cooling at first. The surface can be cold very quickly, so there's no problem with the older zircon ages. They're getting close, of course, to uh, what we think of as the timing for the formation of the Earth, but I'm not losing sleep over this yet um, uh, because the system can heal at the surface, not inside, but at the surface. The system can heal very, very quickly by the collapse of the steam atmosphere, which is on a short time geologically speaking. But even so, we don't have a good understanding of the early evolution of the ocean and atmosphere and part of the magma ocean may take a long time to solidify. So the Earth can have an internal ocean uh, in the mantle for uh, possibly uh, even billions of years in the case of the basal magma ocean. Dynamo could have been initiated early by core cooling, uh, but the development of plate tectonics, the origin of continents is still mysterious as I see it. So last slide, where do we stand? So I would say the context of Earth formation is understood. Compatibility of the geochemical record is quite good, but the devil is in the details, and the details actually matter. There are major puzzles. We don't understand why the Earth and the Moon are so similar in oxygen isotopes. Mars is different. There are ideas for this. There's still a puzzle in understanding 
uh, that. There's a puzzle, I think, still in understanding the uh, Neodymium story in the sense of uh, either uh, impact erosion or the alternative of burying a uh, part of the Earth prior to the giant impact that made the moon that does not uh, get remixed. Uh, the whole business of the degree of mixing in the solar nebula is, is uncertain. Initial condition of the Earth, molten, prompt core formation, transition to a recognizable Earth, rapid freezing in most but not all of the magma ocean, but it's not clear how well the system is mixed. I think that's still an open question as to whether the mantle would be well mixed, even aside from D double prime. And of course, uh, the big mystery of plate tectonics. And I'll stop. And I, I'm sorry, start again. I didn't catch the first part of your question. You said even if the Earth is completely molten, yes. it doesn't mean it's going to be well mixed. Correct. Why? Two reasons. Number one, the Earth's mantle starts out stably stratified with highest entropy at the top, low entropy at the bottom. And that's a natural consequence of an impact. Uh, second point, if I have a basal magma ocean before the giant impact, that will be density stratified anyway for compositional reasons. This is something I'm working on right now. Um, it's, it's a difficult problem. The mixing of the rest of the mantle may be accomplished by the differential rotation produced by the giant impact. So you bring in, you've got an oblique impact. The outer part of Earth's mantle, everything's molten. The outer part of Earth's mantle is rotating faster than the inner part of the Earth. That's a giant Kelvin-Helmholtz instability, which can mix the material. It's not clear that there's enough energy in that differential rotation to overcome the stable stratification of the entropy profile. But it seems quite likely to me that even if it does, a basal magma ocean will not get mixed up in that process. I think it is quite likely that before the giant impact, Immediately before the giant impact, the Earth is pretty close to the solidus. It's hard to cool below the solidus. And in those conditions, you could have a basal magma ocean. So I find that as an attractive way of, of explaining the Neodymium 142 data. Uh, as for impact erosion, the problem there, of course, that is that anything you erode off the Earth comes back. Peter Rolls, Dave McDonough. Peter? Uh, Dave, I don't understand what you mean when you say Conserved. It's what not. We, what we teach undergraduates by the second law is that uh, it's not conserved. Correct. Mm -hmm. But entropy on, on a time scale of a day, which okay. is actually what I'm talking about, except for the entropy production in the impact itself, entropy is conserved when I move things around because there's not enough time to radiatively cool the and, the and, it's a, and there's not enough dissipation to change the entropy a lot. Now, we have looked at this in detail. Um, there is, of course, entropy production when I make a whole bunch of, uh, of blobs of stuff that go into Earth orbit that have different eccentricities and they crash into each other. And so there is an energy that is released and an entropy that is produced by going from the mess, which is what you have at 24 hours after the giant impact, to a disk where everything is happily settled into nice Keplerian orbits. So you're right, entropy is not conserved. But for many questions, you really should think about entropy and not temperature. That's really my main point, because entropy defines the thermodynamic state much more usefully than temperature. You can only talk about temperature if you talk about pressure. If I take a blob of stuff, it could have a temperature of 6,000 at one pressure and at the same entropy, a temperature of 3,000. Bill? Dave, I look to you for at least insights on efficiencies of systems. So in that respect, I mean, one of the things you present is a number of beautiful pictures. And there's two I want to know about. One is in the early solar system, did we, how much mass did we lose? Did we ha start out with two solar systems, two uh, solar masses, or did we start out with less than that? 
The second efficiency question is really when forming the Earth-Moon system, how much might we have lost from that system due to impacts, et cetera, allowing some sort of uh, potential for collision models, collision erosion models. So um, as to the first question of the efficiency of formation of the solar system as a whole, um, uh, of course, most of the gas in the nebula does get expelled back into the interstellar medium, and that's several percent of the mass of the sun. Uh, you are probably more interested in the question of whether the condensate is conserved. That's not so clear. In some stories, you can eject things the mass of the Earth. Uh, so it's possible, I've thought of this long ago, it's possible that there are Earth mass planets in interstellar space and they got there because they got ejected as solar systems form. Uh, but that's going to be, a, as far as we can tell, a small fraction of the total if it happens at all. So I would say in terms of the solar system as a whole, it's a fairly efficient process. You either put stuff in the sun, you eject gas back into the interstellar medium, but perhaps not much solid material. Oh, much better, yeah. Uh, like, say, 90%, something like that. Now, as for the, uh, the whole question of what happens in giant impacts, uh, this is in a, a state of flux. Uh, and one of the people participating in that state of flux is sitting right here, uh, Sarah Stewart. And, uh, and I would say the following, that uh, it would seem likely to me, as Eric Asfalg and others have suggested, that the planetary process is of formation is actually much messier than the models would suggest. You have to remember that when you see a model like that of John Chambers, he's assuming that when two things collide, they just merge and nothing's lost. It's, it's surely going to be more messy. It will depend on uh, how much uh, kinetic energy is available in the impact event but in the kind of simulation that um, Robin Canop did for the formation of the moon, there's actually very little lost. But I would say that more realistically, there may have been impacts where you lose a lot. Uh, uh, there's some recent modeling by Genda, for example, where you could lose 20%. Now that 20%, you have to understand, in my opinion, doesn't actually get truly lost. That is to say, it goes back into the game <laughs> and, and eventually ends up being accumulated on a planet, possibly Earth. And so you should not assume that if you had an early crust on the Earth and you kicked it off into space, that you can then forget about it. Some of it will come back to haunt you. Uh, and, and in general, that's a way of mixing materials that go into making the Earth. And that's why I think the projectile that hit the Earth to make the moon might actually have been more Earth-like than people usually assume. Let me pin you to a number. So you're saying that in an Earth-Moon system, the mass in that system at one astronomical unit out is conserved at, at, at the 99% level. Uh, no, I'm... Oh... Uh, well, uh, the question doesn't seem to me to be that well defined because, of course, I can, I mean, some of the material that comes from that giant impact can end up on Venus or whatever. So I'm not, maybe you can restate the question. I'm not I sure. I had five other hands up, and my apologies to all of you except for Mark who got his hand up first. That'll be the last question. I actually changed my question over the course of this discussion. <laughs> I, I, I had, uh, uh, 20 years ago, I asked Jay Malosh, if this is the case, shouldn't there be terrestrial meteorites? Shouldn't there be things coming back to us now? Right? And that would require that some of these objects get out to the asteroid belt and stick around for four and a half billion years and come back. Is, is that feasible? Or could be tested by the absence, if, if one can test anything by the absence, by the absence of terrestrial meteorites? That's a very interesting question. <laughs> Uh, my, my instinct is to think it's unlikely for two reasons. First, because the material is likely to come back very early, and things that arrive early are not going to be preserved. Um, and it's also not, and, and, and part, of, part of the answer is that it doesn't get to the asteroid belt. Sorry? Things that come back haven't been lost. So the question yes. is do they, do they leave the system? 
Yeah, I think it's quite likely that material, but, but what we're talking about as Earth in this context is not Earth as we see it now. But yeah, I mean, there may have been stuff that was hit off proto-Earth that never came back. Is that, is that your point? Yeah, exactly. Oh, sure, tiny sure. Tiny and, and maybe, so, uh, 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 I suppose it's possible. Um, it may be very unlikely. It, it's one of these things that may have low probability. I, I, I don't, I'm sorry, I have not thought about that question enough to come up, maybe in a few days. Okay, we're going to take a coffee break now. A couple things.